all of them are in your proceedings. So you can stay with me and keep up with me if you want and take notes. I think there's probably six or eight that are really deeper. And I'll try to stress those as we go along as well. So our strategies would be, what does it look like in 2023 on Feed Outlook? And some real challenges, because obviously not only do we, dairy farmers are a little interested about it, the corn and soybean guys are really interested in it as well. So let's get going here. And certainly I love this slide. It's not your PowerPoint on uh, your paper, but it's a change is coming. And trust me, things are changing rather rapidly here. If you look over the last three or four years in this dairy area, as far as that goes. This just came out of Horse Dairyman magazine, uh, came in mind about three days ago. And so they look at what I call kind of a snapshot of the uh, dairy industry. And so I got Maine up there, I got Illinois up there, and I got the U.S. up there. And things are really changing. In fact, I was surprised Illinois is almost a mere image of Maine. We look at the milk deal for cow. That's our problem in Illinois. We need more milk out of our cows if we're going to keep up with that U.S. Because trust me, I never give up milk because milk always makes me more money. If you can look at cow numbers, you can see those numbers as well, how they changed Maine and Illinois, very similar, but look at the national. You know, now, you know, now. Think, think about that as if you're, if you're a dairy farmer or if it's the main dairy industry, as far as that goes, number of farms and herd sizes, we're pretty close. We're pretty close on herd sizes as well. And if you come to Illinois, don't come to milk. We have a quarter. Based on pounds of milk. And so there is no growth in Illinois in the last four years because farmers can't grow. And I think maybe that also may apply in here as well because some of your milk processors also have supply management. We do call ours a quota. Well, most other companies want to call supply management. I think it's the same thing. But we'll leave it alone. We'll leave it alone. So that's kind of fun to look at. I'm not sure if my Illinois milk producers board looks at this and sees any concerns, but they should. Well, let's move on. There's about three choices. You can vote here today. Got an election coming. I see everybody running again. So we have a lot of people running elections in 2024. You can either have higher milk production, higher feed costs. Circle that one. That's where you're going to be. Number two, I've got dairymen doing number one. And number two, we're going to pull back on feed. Too expensive. Bad. Bad. We'll see why this is good later. And then, of course, you wish number three be correct. And we're going to see a little bit of that in Illinois. Now, I understand you guys are challenged up here in terms of trying to get some of that Illinois corn over here. But have you seen the corn market in the last four or five days? It's dropped down about 40, 50 cents a bushel. So the question is, it's almost like inflation. Are we dropping corn prices too fast? Well, let's move on. So what, what's going to happen? Good luck, guys. Here it is. You can circle. I'm going to take that quiz. What do you think are going to be the, the biggest factor on my sheet? I don't know. But I think inflation is going to be a big one. I pick inflation because consumer demand, we just saw in the national magazines, dairy production, dairy consumption went down 2% in this magazine. They were surprised because the price of dairy price in the U.S. went up 22%. They're expecting people to be really backing off on your cheese and your butter and some of your other dairy products, yogurts, things like that. With that inflation, I don't see a lot of our Illinois dairy farmers building, updating, adding robots. Robots are coming. Who's got robots here? Anybody got, anybody got robots here today? That's going on. Get ready. They're coming. What about those crooks in Brazil and Argentina? What's the what's the good news? Argentina is what? Big trouble with drought. They're dropping their soybean production by 20 to 25 percent. Well, those crooks in Brazil. They will have more soybeans than we have in the United States. We don't go China. If China doesn't like us, we move on. What about that war? I'll let you make that one there. What scares me is milk prices down, we are guessing about $3 this year. Got a time when your feed, labor, fertilizer, all going up, all going up. So uh, hatch on. And then what about this ethanol production? Three percent of the corn in the United States goes to ethanol, and now they got electric cars, and they're not driving as much as wind. And so they're hoping to increase the ethanol level in your gas from ten percent to fifteen percent. Or big oil, we'll leave that at where it's at. So good luck on this one. You can circle where you think we're gonna. Which one of these are gonna have the most impact? 
So these are the planning intentions. Came out of a magazine about three weeks ago. It looks like we're going to grow more corn, no change of soybeans, a little bit more wheat. Where's some of this increase coming from? Idle acres and not do not plant. I didn't realize there's a government program. You get paid for not planting a crop. Really, it's the same as weather, flooding, those kinds of things as well. So we're going to have hopefully more feed, feed grains available, more human and animal use. Here's a message. You guys don't raise much corn and soybeans here, but this simply says if you look at the May outlook, this comes from one of our local uh, corn and soybean growers right in central Illinois. And the answer there is don't sit on your corn, guys, gals. Market that now. Because they're projecting that they're going to see about a dollar a bushel drop in May. So that depends a lot on what? How much snow you have up here in Maine and how much we get the ground and all those other factors as well. So you probably don't have to worry about this PowerPoint, but our dairymen, all my dairymen in Illinois, by and large, have what? Corn and soybeans to sell. Because most of them are running 30, 100 to 400 acres of good black soil. And so they can't run that all through their dairy gap. And so they're, they're in the corn business as well. Here's the margins, <clears throat> according from our aggressive ag econ group. Uh, farm doc return per acre of corn 680 bucks last year. Phenomenal. So now you know why some farmers aren't building cows anymore because they can make as much money as they need. The only reason you guys and gals have dairy cows is what you're going to take those expensive inputs and add value to it. So there's probably about 15 percent of our dairy farmers just got to get out of the business because they're tremendous crop growers, but they're not making any money. Putting those crops through their dairy camp. We call that value add. So hopefully you're in that camp as well. And so you can see now, according to next year, hopefully those numbers might be significant lower. So they're all looking pretty strongly at the government insurance program fronts, as far as that goes. Well, what are we going to do? Let's get down to the real nuts and bolts here. What are the solutions I see in 2023? And the good news is. You've got agronomists on your faculty now. For some reason, all our craftspeople are born certain people. We used to have a, we used to have a legendary uh, alfalfa breeding program in Illinois and a forage specialist. And they've been both gone. So here's your answer. Here's your answer. For every one of you dairymen, you need to know all these answers. You should evaluate your crop. Ah, particle size. Who's got a Penn State box here? Anybody got a Penn State box here? You have really set the pace at this point. The Penn State box, tremendous tool. Fragility, what's that? A pound of straw versus a pound of corn silage. You think they have different fragilities, breakdowns, texture? Sure they do. And we're going to start evaluating forages on fragility. NDF, NDF digestibility, we're going to touch on that one a bit. The new kid on the block, UNDF. Now, those of you that are forage testing, you should know all these answers, all these numbers as far as that goes. Starch levels, starch digestibility, particle size of the corn, more about that a bit later, and then, of course, starch digestibility. So your forages, you have lots of measurements to say, yes, Martha, we've got a great crop of this year. So what I would do is make sure that this year, if you're feeding forages, you have these numbers. So the next year, you can watch See if there's an opportunity out there in the farms. I love this slide. It has good application here in Maine. And so what about these forages? We're going to look at MDF 30. That means after 30 hours, how much of that MDF, that cell wall, is digested? Now, good luck because your lab will give you MDF 40, MDF 48, MDF 120, MDF 240. Pick one. Say, I, I go 30 because my farmers understand that. And that's a part of time those forages are in your digestive tract, your cows. Researchers want 48 because it's a predictable number. I understand that. But look at these curves. Anybody here raising BMR corn size? Anybody got BMR corn size? Got a couple hands going up here in the front row. Notice that is the winner. That is the winner. That, that's that curve right here. And you want to be, not politically speaking, you want to be on the right on this curve. 
And you can see that this will be 65% NDF digestibility. Huge number. You test your corn silage? You need to know that because Illinois, guess what? Some of the BMRs are not 65. Here's such a regular corn silage. You'll notice it's about 10 units lower. And that's why some of you guys and gals are looking at BMR. Now the question, what about yield rate? Always a question in Illinois. We have a dry August in Illinois. That corn says. So we move on. Here's sits your legume. Here's legume. You can see, you can see it's almost a 20 unit shift. Anybody here using the low latent alfalfa? Low latent, got a couple hands going up. The organic guys, you can raise that because there are two kinds. There are two kinds of low latent or lower latent alfalfas. One's GMO, you can't touch that, I understand that. But some of it is pure genetics. And what's that gonna do? It's gonna shift this curve to the right at the same date. Same time of cutting. Most of my guys in the Midwest are using this because it buys them an extra week of time to still make high quality forages. The number I like to look at here is my small grains. Why we're excited? Look, look how fat that is. What does it mean? Tremendous variation. We're talking about crit, wheat, rye. Who's got cover crop? Anybody got cover crops here? Write that down. You're not raising cover crop. There's a huge opportunity. So here in Illinois, we get paid a small amount on their crop insurance, deduction, put in cover crops. We call that a win-win. It's a win because I get a little payment to defer the seed cost. And number two, we know what it does with soil, nutrient loss, water runoff. It's just amazing. And I get two forage crops a year, not one, two of them. We move on. So this basically is dry cows. This is high producing cows. In fact, we call that blue line right here, poor man's corn silage. Because it has the NDF digestibility of corn silage that doesn't have that starch. But the tremendous crop, tremendous crop made, right? Good, good luck. Illinois, you got seven days to make it. So if you get a two inch rain, when you're gonna cut your small crop, cover crops, good luck. Because our equipment can't be in the field, so I just that close. Here's such your grasses, and now we're seeing a regrowth in grasses. Some of the newer grasses coming out of here look really pretty good. So now we see, especially on some of these pastures, for the organic guys, we call it cocktail mixes. So we'll have a couple different species of grasses, and, and in that mix, they may have some legumes and clovers in there as well, and really finding good success. So lots of opportunities on this slide. Lots of opportunities. And the question is, on your farm, which curve do you want? Which curve are you getting? So how good was the, uh, the crops? This comes out of a major Midwest lab. You can see it listed at the bottom down there. And you can look at corn silage. If you look at it, it's in your handout. You can see that the crop looked quite good. The numbers I would circle. Here's your NDF 30. Notice down a little bit, but now nah, statistically probably not going to be there. You kiss New Hampshire. So that's an important number. Look at that you had to write that number or circle that number. Below 10. Any Jersey people here? Got some Jersey people? Got Jerseys? See any hands going up? Why would I ask them? Because their cows don't have as much room as those big old Holsteins. So these cows get filled up. They can only eat so much because the UADF fills them up. From like going to the smorgasbord, eating way too much salad. By the time you get down to the meat and potatoes, you can't eat enough of them to get your bill paid. But we move on. We move on. So I was supposed to be funny. All the three of you are laughing. <laughs> Your kids understand. Are we going too fast? You understand? We'll move on. We'll move on. So we got to start circle this number here. These three numbers. NDFD, NDF 30, that's 30 hours. That stands for amylase. That gets rid of the starch. It's that NDF. Organic matter gets rid of the, the dirt. Not a lot of nutrients in dirt. And then here's this, my starch number. That's the big numbers there. Let's move on. Here's your BMR for the four or five of you raise your hands. Here's it's your BMR, and sure enough, this you can see just exactly. It tends to be wetter. It tends to be wetter. You'll notice. Look at the look at the NDF digestibility. Basically, eight units higher. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. 
That's why you feed the high producing cows. That's why you feed the, the closer cows. Why do you feed the closer cows? You want to keep the dry matter up on these cows. Another story for another day. And of course, you can see the starch in this study. You can see, uh, look at the five year average. Tend to be a couple units lower in starch. For the corn, it's seven bucks a bushel. For the main, so there's your BMR compared. Here's the haylage. Again, you can see good crops last year. Some years we really get hammered here, but you want to look at it again. Here's your NDF 49, 30, 16. What was the corn? Do you remember that? Some number of corn? Yeah. Who said nine? First in line. You're first in You're listening close. And she's not even cheating. Nine. So simply says, if you look at this number here, my haylage really fills these cows up. And the ashes up on these cows. But here's the magic number right there. RFQ, relative forest quality index. Every dairy farmer who's raising legumes and grasses should know that number. Should be over 140. Otherwise, you can dry cows and peppers. Give us under 100. So those big cow calf guys. But that stuff is not very good. Not very good. Good numbers. Good numbers to look at. How good can this stuff get? Anybody go to World Dairy Expo here at all? In the World Dairy Expo? If you go to World Dairy Expo, a couple of hands going up. They always have a forage contest there. And I go there every year when I go home. And last year, look at the haylage. RFQ, 277. I think we can eat that for lunch here today. At the salad, it's that good. It's that good. There's a little scanty in there. Look at my corn size, 42% starch. And then you can tell that the MR, look at that number. Almost 76. It's almost a concentrate. Almost as good as oats. Let me read the oats. We've had a lot of oats in our farm. Goes back a few years as well. So this stuff made right, and actually, that's your answer. This stuff is good. And second of all, I was impressed. Some of you are writing some really high bar fat tests. Most people say, well, you're just cheating. You're feeding fat to those cows. Well, that'd be true in some farms, but the other ones, lots of forage. So a lot of us are feeding 55% forages. We're going to be in the future. If you can get these kinds of forages, and if you can get those, get them up here, you'll get those 60, 65% forage of the production right now. So there's some real opportunities there as well. So here we go. So there's your numbers to take a look at. Here's the one you might want to circle. It's my best guess from Rick Grant. And that is about 5.6 pounds and a 1,400 pound Holstein cow. So that's the number you go home and calculate. Coming from forage, that's the fill factor. So if you're over 5.6, you're going to have to get better quality forages or replace it with something that is better quality. I think you might probably give you an example. My jersey number, quite a bit lower. Quite a bit lower. Now, don't go to zero here. Is that you, NDF, also does what in the Roman? Country. Forage map. Rate of passage. So it becomes an important factor there as well. So certainly, that you, NDF, becomes a very powerful number. So if you do not know what that number is, you're going to be so excited after this talk. See where you're at this year. Today's ration. And then the one next fall. When you got the new crop that came in as well. Another story, and that is building milk components. So I can embellish the milk check with components. So the question is, is there an opportunity for you there? Here are the last prices that just came out. Some of you probably saw them already. Butter fat, $2.72 a pound. Milk protein, $2.37. In January, those are flipped. They flip. Depends on what processors you want. You make cheese, you make butter, or they don't make a lot of ice cream. So that number is jumping around a little bit. I would argue my bias is the world is going to buy milk. They want animal protein, like beef, chicken, pork, dairy farm. So I think milk protein. So if you are breeding cows, 
and your genetic parameters you're looking for bulls that are going to build milk protein pounds of milk protein are ready for you so what is your genetic base because you're going to reap those benefits in the next five or ten years well where does all that go this comes on a progressive dairyman in one of their slide columns here about a month ago roughly 42 percent goes to cheese another 18 percent goes to butter the other one percent goes to fluid milk. Not a big surprise because everybody's drinking what? Pretty sad. Pretty sad. Stressful ice cream, yogurt, places like that. So it's kind of fun to see. So if we see a nice jump in cheese prices, which happened yesterday, guess what that's going to do? That's good news for your dairy. There we go. So. Here's Holstein data. I see it in Jersey hands goes up. So we'll just stay with Holstein. This is the DHIR. Just be aware of that now. DHIR data that is reported at the various breed meetings. Ford's always had one of the editors there. And so in the July or August issue, there it is. Holstein's 4%. What's the exciting part of that, guys and gals, over the last three years? We're seeing bar fats in whole seeds, really fun. The other breeds are not. Gee, I track this every year. So I can go back 15 years and look at that if I want to. But you can see here's the protein 3.12. And this is the number you want to circle on your paper 78% or 0.78. That's the ratio of fat and protein. So if I take four and divide that into 3.2, that's 78%. And I'll bet you a piece of pie. If you look at me, I don't lose many pie bets. I'll bet you a piece of pie. If you look at your first lactation cows, your second and third lactation cows, it's different. You look at 100 days of pie, it's different. And so the question is, well, I call that an opportunity. Now, you'll see this all over. This comes to the University of Wisconsin. They do the reciprocal. They divide. The protein into the fat, and that's 1.28 or 120 percent. It's the same value. It's whichever value that you're more comfortable with on your dairy farm. Or hard people would say, just do it. Just do it. Because you may discover some opportunities. This also is the Horch Dairyman. They gave me their slide. And you can see these are the federal milk marketing orders. You notice maybe is not in the federal market. I'm with Dave on that, the way over. You didn't have a really good reason why you are not going to milk order. A lot of your milk is based on the, on the Boston market. But you can see all over the map, all over the map. Now you notice in Florida and Appalachia, there is no protein there because that is what? Back to about 10 years ago, our, some of our best Jersey herds were switching to old students until our co op was forced. So there you can see a lot of variation up in the map. Don't ask me why those crooks in the Southwest are so high, but they have the highest values that you're able to do that. Who's the real winner? Well, the good news is I saw four people turn the page. So the rest of you are not following me at all. You're so excited about the presentation. You are not even following me. you're saying this guy is. Move on. Now here's your second one you want to circle. And again, most of you are going to be on DHI tests. At least I hope you are. That's another problem in Illinois with a half my herds on the DHI test. I'll give you many cows if you don't have data. Anyway, here's what you want to look at. Here is different lactation. One, two, three. Here is milk yield. We broke it into four different groups. Pretty fancy group. You get 30,000 pounds of milk. Let me tell you, you're not on the food stamps. You're really doing well. And then you take a look and you see where does this data come from? North Carolina. So I'm pretty sure you guys are being processed by North Carolina. Right on that? Yes, no, where my dairy went. So no, this is field data. Did it 19, uh, 2017. So this is your data. And look at over here on protein, guys. And guys. Every one of these herds are what? Oh, but that is not protein, this. Just saying, I put corn out of two cans. 
city pot take average, the main pot take average, the city pot take average. We're talking real money, real money. Look at butterfat again, it's a real opportunity. This doesn't surprise me here. Notice after the 40 80 to melt to 100, all these tending below 370. Why is that? Well, probably they melt off most of the condition they're going to move, uh, melt off. Number two, we probably can't get any more dry matter into these cows to meet all their end requirements. And guess what the cows give up? It's melt faster. They give up. So, what are your cows telling you on your farm? When you go home and, and buy, if you're on DHA, you've got all this data. They break it down by days, they break it down by parity, and they summarize it every month on my farm. Powerful, powerful information. The good news on milk fat, you'll see the good herds are not in the red. So I would argue they're doing a bit of managing energy on those farms as well. There's my jerseys, you got it. Same information, fewer herds. This also came from horse dairy milk. Now we've got pages turning, that's good. We make the progress here. Even the New Hampshire table is turning. I'm keeping an eye on this because I have to report back to Pete Harris. What what his students were there. very attentive. Oh, one was a little slow there, young lady. I'm watching. Anyway, this is components. What's that looking like on your farm? What did you get down there, guys and gals? Heat stress. Heat stress. Now maybe that's not a problem. Maybe. Let me tell you, it's a problem in Illinois. You can see on uh, these farms here, and this is national data again. What we got here, and this cow, you can see that we still hear it. 2022, 20, 23, we still see the summer soil. Two tenths on fat, one tenth on protein, maybe a little more. Put that to your calculator tonight at home and see how much money that has cost you every day under heat stress. It should be looking at that. Maybe not an important pot topic here in May. I'm going to put Dave on the spot and we'll get into that. So, what about these breed differences here? You can look at them. Again, I went back to that same database. Remember, this is DHIR. So it is 365 days, mature equivalent, so we're fair with you. Because the national milk average is not 28,000, but notice five and a half pounds of that protein. Now, every one of you dairymen know this number. But you're paying on that. You're paying on that. So there's another assignment you gotta go home for. If you don't go home and do one or two calculations, then you just invested 45 minutes into something that you're not going to do. So let's move on. So here's an example. This would be that same data. 75 pounds of milk of Holsteins. With these components, 5.4 pounds. There you are. There is where you've got to be. If you're not there, you better get there the next year or two. Notice my increased components because you're under quota, like in Illinois. I can get that number up to another three tenths of a pound by increasing my components. And three tenths of a pound, and about two and a half dollars a pound. Hey, I'll take that a dollar plus per cow per day there. Notice, like, uh, here's my goal for you whole scene guys. If you're at six pounds, hooray for you. We got a good herder here in Maine. They said there are some good herders here in Maine. They'll be over seven. They'll be over seven. So certainly a tremendous opportunity. Our best herd in Illinois, 400 cow, Holstein registered herd, but recognized by Holstein Association. We're sitting here at 104 pounds of milk, 4, 2, and 3, 3. And I have a feeling the bankers don't see them very family run operation. Father, two sons, daughter in law, and two daughters. That's the labor story on the farm. So again, nice benchmarks that'll help solve this question. How are you going to compete with higher feed prices in 2023? Well, they we all do this. We have feed additives. Feed additives are out there. There are several booths here that can talk to you about feed additives. So again, we're going back to the horse dairyman. They do a market survey. So if you are a horse dairyman reader, you could have been in this survey over the years. They pick about 1,200 each year. And they ask them what color tractors are you running, what type of milk equipment do you have, what type of herbicide you use. They also ask 
unanimously. And so you can see, I just put up there 2015, 2021. They don't change a great deal. A couple of them do. So you can see sodium bicarb or buffers are number one. Menza, they said only 30% of the farmers said they're feeding the Menza. This is not, this is farms now, not cows. But the Atlantico would say they're feeding close to 60% of the herds in the United States with the Menza. That's the Miami. The Menza. So I'm not sure, maybe this, uh, the, the survey might have said uh, Monenza. And some dairymen would say, what in the world is Monenza? It's Romenza. It's Romenza. Anyway, that's an interesting number. Here's the other one I find interesting. Look at these binders. How many here are feeding a microtoxin binder? Anybody feeding? We got some hands going on. We're getting pretty close. Pull the trigger saying. That's another whole talk for another day on microtoxin binders, but it's there, guys and gals. If you don't believe it, talk to your chicken friends and some of the swine people because they know. A little bit of microtoxin does what to their average daily gains? So, growing animals on average daily gains. So, think about that one a little bit. This one is going to get more interest. This is one of the products that is a name, not name product, by the way, Omnigen. And that stimulates the immune system. And that's going to be important in June this year. Why is that going to be important in June? Boy, this gets you from the buffet line. Why will this be important in June? Antibiotics are going away. Or you're going to have to go through a veterinary and do a scripted for it. So you can't go to farm fleet anymore. You can't go to the drugstore or buy them. It has to go through veterinary. How old am I? But it seems we really want healthy cows. We really want healthy cows. There's some averages. And this is just one of them. There's several on the market now. That look like they're going to stimulate the immune system. And by stimulating that one thing they're monitoring, guess what? Synthetic cell count. They're monitoring synthetic cell count. There's a lot of other things that are needed as well. Well, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to use them. The worst one I hear as well, it's uh, number three. You're a poor manager, and we're going to cover up the additives. Shame on you. That's not true. The only reason you're feeding them is to enhance the profit margins on your farm. On your farm. Another one is it's over 10 cents. I'm Dutch. It's over 10 cents more cow. I'm pretty careful with the Roman pull trigger that way. It's three cents. I might give that a try for three cents a cow a day and see if I'm out of stone. So certainly these becomes factors as well. Now you got this in front of you. Now, if you're a really good nutritionist, I'll ask these folks in New Hampshire. If they're going to study nutrition, when they read New Hampshire, they should know what every one of those products do and how they function. The reason I show it for you is because these will work energy balance, calcium balance, immune function, take a look at that. Rumen enhance, that's where most of them sit. Reproduction, hoof health, protein efficiency, and microtoxin binders. So the point is, lots of choices out there. And most feed companies will buy them, get them in for you, if you've got the money. Heaven. Let's skip that one and go here, because our time is going to get tight here. So always there's a list. Use it to my ears. Sharing on. Now she's going to share. Okay. This is my list. Now, this meeting is way too big, but I've done this in some other meetings, especially in this feed company meeting. I want you to write down which feed address you routinely recommend to your dairy farmers. Here are my six. Rune buffers, yeast product, rumenza or monenza, size inoculants, biotin, and organic trace minerals. That's my six, and I'm getting real pressure to add to that. Somewhere around a dime per cow per day. Now, I had an dairy farmer who said, You know, my wife, my spouse, said, You can't buy all six of them, Mike. They let me buy one, maybe two on a good day. So he says, What's your priority? 
and there's one. Some of you will be surprised. You're going to see that remensin uh, or essential oils. Why do we say essential oils? Where are my organic farmers? Any organic people here? Got organic? Got some hands going up. Hey. Benefits of more than invite you to think the correct essential oil. They're there. And that data was coming from Europe, some in the United States as well. The big one in Canada, I'm not sure if it's here or made, and Anglin. Anybody heard of Anglin? Anglin is a new product coming out of Switzerland. And in Pennsylvania, guess what they're doing? If you feed that product to your cows, you get $4 a cow a year. Well, I won't put you on uh, high, high, high hog on economics. Who's paying that $4? Starbucks. How are you? Are paying for that because they're going to what? If you buy your dairy products from Target, you are going to be very green because the folks in Pennsylvania are feeding a product that's going to reduce methane production by about 10 or 11 percent based on the research. Starbucks. That's what we're Now, the good news is because it reduces dry matter intake slightly, as does Remenzin. Increase in milk production slightly, increase speed efficiency, and that's worth about 70 cents a pound a day. Things to be thinking about, guys. Things to think outside the box. I got five inoculum second. That's just because you're here today. Five inoculum second. Five inoculum second because I want to make sure my body is really from that problem. I'm not going to ask which wild bacteria are there. I'm going to dictate the fermentation profile of that silage because the research says the payback is six to one. You know, if I spend 60 cents on inoculant, I'm going to get $3.60 back from top performance based on cannabis state research by uh, the former Hasselwing in Bolton. Remensin is there because it's an antibiotic. That's why your organic dyes can help. Can't feed it. This is an antibiotic. What's the good news? Stays in the digestive tract. Unlike some other things we talked about at supper, but we'll be that one won't at this point. The things in milk that you and I don't want to read about, hear about, but it's there. Anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't happen in the milk, but it's an antibiotic. And it pulls down fiber digesting bacteria because of the cell wall of the bacteria. So it increases starch digesting bacteria. That's why some farmers might see what prevents it. Oh, that is. The say, yeah, that's possible. If you're changing the ruined microflora. By the way, you grass through New Hampshire, that's a great area to work on. We are going to manipulate ruined fermentation by looking at micro, microbial populations. We're going to change that. Or at least study that as far as that goes. Here are my organic trace minerals. I don't surprise some of you here in the audience. Why is that? And you say, why not? Because it's got immunity written all over it. How come? Selenium. Chromium. Anybody eat chromium here? Anybody eat chromium in their cows? Uh, I'm thinking about that because it affects what? What glucose? And insulin. And guess what happens in transition cows? That would be a problem. A big risk, especially the older cows. So I got that one third. You might not have it quite that high. You see these culture products there. My carb is fifth. Why is it so low? It's the most popular one in the United States. Because your nutritionist in your book study in New Hampshire said we can make rations that do not cause acidosis in cows. For its quality, for its particle size, level of stuff. There's a way you can feed your way out of life. You cannot feed your way out of essential oils. I'm sorry. Essential oils are the same way you're resident. It changes the room and microflora. So why is all this research coming from Europe and essential oils? Government doesn't allow just like EST in the US, we go out. The government, no process. Another story for another day. We will get on that political discussion right now as well. Biotin is sixth. Biotin is a B vitamin. How does it be fed as women protected biotin? It's on the market. It's two things. It hardens the bullets. It also increases. Four pounds of milk, 
plus your eight cents, you get this product in. What do you think? What your debt should say, man, there's money on the table. Let's say a quick word about one of the hot topics now in Illinois. And in the farm magazines, that's about calcium levels in transition cows. This uh, beautiful slide comes from Gary Etzel at the University of Wisconsin. The yellow line, you see that one? Your cows just have. The line, and that is how much calcium should be in her blood. That should be 8.2. That didn't get reproduced in my PowerPoint. Nothing to do with it. 8.2 milligrams for this. That's kind of a cut. That's the magic number. That's what a cow should be buying. So let's talk about cows that get enough fever. And there they are in the red. Put down to all five milligrams for this liter. And if you don't treat her or the veterinarian, she's going to die. She's going to die. That's milk fever. Clinical milk fever. So all the excitement is coming out in the green one. And these are cows that are not going to die, but these are all hypo. Calcemic cow. Write that down because Pete Erickson will never understand it. Hypocalcemic cows. These are low blood calcium cows. And you'll see that they dip down just before calving, probably due to dry matter intake, hormonal changes, dietary effects. The Democrats, who knows why? But we move on. Who knows? I thought that'd be popular. This is a Democratic vote. Couldn't vote or shut Okay, we'll move on. You'll notice these cows drop down. That is biologically normal. Now, the good news is that if they come back within one, uh, 36 hours, they will be your highest producing cows. How would you know that? You know, I think in the next year or two, we're going to have blood calcium tests at the farm, just like we do for NEFAS, non stir fatty acids, or I should say for ketone body. So keep your eyes and ears open for that. So, what are my farmers doing for second, third, and fourth ligation cows? They are giving them a calcium bolus. Anybody using bolus in the cows at camp? Go ahead. Oh, I got some hands going up. That's good. You see, I'm not going to take that chance, especially my older cows, because young cows have two advantages. Number one, they absorb calcium more quickly. And number two, they can mobilize bone, which is a calcium reserve. And cows can't do that. That's why old cows get no fever. Some cows don't. And jerseys get more milk fever than whole seeds. Probably a genetic factor. I'm not totally sure at this one, but anyway, they do. We move on. Now, those of you who raise your hand, write this down. So your bolus is delivered 50 grams of calcium in the bolus or boluses. I say that because we stopped at a farm supply office about five years ago, and they were selling, I need to get your cows for four boluses, you say. Wow. They are really getting calcium. I pulled up about but they were cheap. cheap. By the way, also, those calcium sources should be calcium chloride, which makes it more biologically available quicker than calcium stomach, which is a slow one. So, if you are boluses, how much calcium and what are your sources of calcium? And I'm not sure. I'm going to cheap state. Guess how I'm putting your boluses. Jones for a Not very biologically effective if you raise the blood level. Oh, by the way, you put those bolus in, and we're looking at this one. This will bring these, these blood calcium levels up for about six or eight hours. And you and I are both hoping what? All taste control. All of our immune systems kick in and she goes all the way. But if she was still looking at the edging, if you're in a stall barn or that, you can look at these. My dad could see it. He said, son. That cow is going to be enough. Sure enough, that'll be out eight or ten hours later. And I mean, like, cow. But if you could have access to those cows, and I know some of you have big herds here today, you can only restrict them for once every 24 hours. So you can only bolus every 24 hours. But in the real world, you do it six or eight hours after you gave the first boluses for those cows that look like they are not responding and their systems are not taken again. Okay, so that's an important fact. You're using some of this technology, eyes wide open. The other question is this slide right here. There's four different levels of calcium that you can give to your transition cows. Transition cows, two weeks before calving, and three weeks after. The first one comes from Penn State, and that is a calcium deficient diet. 
Well, good luck on that one. So we have something called zeolite. Anybody heard of zeolite? Anybody using zeolite here? No, there's a new product you've been thinking about. I don't know that just a minute. Or you can just go to the NRC or the NACE book and see what's recommended. Or you can go partially acidify. I'm going to put a product in that's going to cause urine levels to drop pH between six to seven. And then there's something called fully acidifying, which means I put one product here, I drop the pH in a little bit lower. And you can put company names in each of these. And you're reading the horse area, and you're reading the best area. If I put this one every three months on uh, this one as well. We in Illinois. Did the research on the fully certified? Okay. We're, we're basically recommending bad program. No. Here on the bell program, just working. Hooray for you. Don't change. Don't change. Sorry, that goes. So here's a new kid in the block. Comes from Denmark. And it's called Zeolite. That is a generic name. It's got a fancier name here in the US. Just hit the market about two years ago. And it's a binder. Actually, what I do is send you just being a force binder very more dangerous for your, your fire reach products as well. And it was zeolite binds calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and who knows what else. Zinc, selenium, copper, we don't know. We don't know. But it does bind. The good news is it binds the calcium up. And so now you don't have to run your pHs. How many here are running urine pH? Anybody run a urine pH on, on, on our cows? Good, because the hand's going up. That's what we need to do. Have to run urine pH. You need to know. That acidification is, that's, that's high technology. You get it wrong and you will have problems on your farm. You don't have to worry about with this product here. They don't care what the potassium level is. It just ties up the calcium and it makes these cows mobilize or absorb calcium. What if I did that for 40 days? Cost two bucks. It's about four times the price of these traditional acidifiers. Ran into a whole hotbed of this up in Canada. Veterinary clinics had every one, every one of their people that they work with on this product because they were convinced it really works. And 500 grams, that's a pound, more than a pound. So you're gonna put a pound of rock in this little up ration. And these cows eat about 26 pounds of dry matter. So now I'm putting a pound of something in that has no nutrient value. It's worse, it's worse than strong. It's worse than strong. So lots of things to think about here. We're just washing it. I've got two feet company and one salt in Illinois that's going with it. So we're going to check on our dairy and see how we get along with the program. What about these fresh cows? There's a list. It changes a little bit. You notice we now have buffers back in here. Wasn't as close up because buffers are what? You're going the wrong way with a buffer. There's a new buffer in the marketplace that's being mined in the North Sea. It's a calcium carbonate, magnesium carbonate source, and that looks encouraging. Acid buff is one of the names they use for that product. And you can feed that to your full sub dry cows to reduce any risk of acidosis. Here sits my boluses down here. Here's my organic chromium, and I got room protective uh, uh, organic chromium, and I now have room protective choline sitting there as well. Anybody using choline here? Using choline transition cows? Hands on. Under these feet, people, you may discover there's some opportunity on your farms as well. And then I have what I call as needed. These are usually drenched. These are drenched products. Glycerol will go into that one as well. Glycerol is on the marketplace because it's a byproduct from making what? And maybe in the future, fly the planes. So hang on to that one. I put some real pressure on soybean and fat sources. Fats are really expensive right now. And that's one of the reasons they're really expensive as far as that goes as well. 
There's your microtoxin binders. By the way, there are two general categories. All binders are not the same. This one is used primarily for aflatoxin. This one is using being used for vomitoxin, T2, and some of those other what I call less stressed microtoxin. These are probably more common on your farms. And then, of course, you can use acids, primarily acetic acid and propionic acid, to pickle your real pain with super amp, or on your high moisture corn to pickle it to keep it from going bad. Well, wake up. Here we go. We're my business people. Here we go. Well, I can't keep changing these numbers quick enough. Right now, the price of corn is $6.20 a bushel. I'm not sure you're going to see it here, Dave. Well, you're buying corn in Central Illinois. You can buy right from the co op in Central Illinois. Soybean meal, it's sitting up at about 480 in Illinois right now. 480. No idea what it costs in Maine. I have it here. And then, of course, hay prices are sky high. The high quality, really high return. So these are high prices. Every month I get this report from a colleague. It's the Ohio State. Sesame program, if you're getting progressive dairymen, it's in their magazine every issue. And what they're doing is they're using the software program, putting in 30 different feeds in Ohio, or you could do this in Maine. Fun extension project. Put your feed prices in, and you can see anything in red is overpriced. So this is the current price in Illinois. Be, be careful. Illinois, not Maine. Illinois and break even says uh, it's a good buy. If you're below that number, it's a good buy. And you here sits corn silage. I'm not sure how much corn silage you can grow here in Maine. It's like a little snow, or you're a little cooler than you have in Illinois. So we recommend two thirds corn silage, one third legume grass, pasture bales, whatever you want to do. That's our forage program. If you are going to be a cheap detriment. You're going to have to do lots of corn silage because it is what? Cheap. And if you really want to play hardball, that's the market price $55 a ton. If you raise that in Illinois, it's more like $32, $25. So I can really raise it quite a bit cheaper. So it's going to become a really economical source in the feeding program. So those are some of your choices. You can see again. Uh, the break-even price is about two fifty a ton, and if you're going to go for high-quality hay, one eighty or higher, and the number I'm getting is one dollar and twenty-five cents a point for every point of RFU, relative quality forage index. So you can take two hundred times uh, one twenty-five, and you see very quickly you're going to be up in that uh, two hundred eighty, two hundred fifty dollar ton range. Here's a slide you want to look at. Corn distillers, good deal. Corn gluten, good deal. Anybody feed the distillers grains here? Corn distillers grains in their mouth for the protein supplement. I see any hands going up here. That's really a good deal for us. Corn gluten used to be really cheap. For some reason, it's no longer really cheap. Exporting it to China and Mexico. I don't know what's going on, but it used to be really cheap. Again, you see some of these byproduct feeds look good. Soy oil is not a good deal for us. But the cotton seeds not a good deal for us. Pretty dumb computer. Look at what's at cost. All we're doing is looking at cost. We've got to speed up here because I'm going to get the five minute warning here in a second. Speed efficiency. Every main very funny. has to have this number up here. You get it. Conventional it simply says how effective. Are your cows taking dry milk and feed and converting as well? Powerful number. And so this comes from Ohio State. It's a nice table you've got in front of you there. Linda did a nice job getting this out to you here. So it says if you've got an 80 pound tank here, and this is 3.5 fat corrected milk. So when all this work was done, that was the tip of the whole three 3.5. So you guys got a 4 2 butter fat test, guess what? And you convert that over to 3.5. And you pick up about a pound of milk for every tenth of a pound of fat above three five. So if you got four two, you're going to add about seven pounds of milk to the equation. Anyway, here's the magic number for eighty pound, seventy pound. But you can see as I go to milk yield, 
My feet efficiency goes up, which means what? For every pound of dry matter, those buggers are consuming power. Just a powerful, powerful tool. Why is it so powerful? Well, if I stay at 70 pounds an hour, and that's my cost per pound of dry matter in Illinois right now, 15 cents a pound for dry matter. Where was it three years ago? Trust me, we don't have friggin' RV away anymore either, but I'll bet you if you buy the higher one. Oh, it's one of those girls. See, if I go from one four to one five, holding milk constant, 50 cents more profit a day. How many would think there'd be a good need if you could buy 25 cents more profit per cow per day? Yeah, that's my goal. Can you find a nine or a quarter cent piece on your farm based on some of the numbers they have going here? Here are the two goals. Go fast. You've got them. So here's the four numbers you must have. If you are a business person, you're going to look at one of your most expensive inputs in dairy cows, and that's called what? Cost. Here's my 15 cents. Calculate it out. I can show you how it's done. Move back to it. Here's my 80 pound pounds of milk. That's about where my state average is going to be at. I'm going to have cost per 100 weight of milk at 10 bucks. Income or feed cost, 12 bucks. I need 11. I need 11. The pay, the power, the fuel. All these other fixes. Well, I don't know what is it made. What is that margin going to be? And there's your feed efficiency. And here's that farmer who said, I'm just going to be in less. They're in the red. Every one of those numbers go which way? So, here's the last two things. Promise. Kernel processing score. Who's got a kernel processing score on their corn silage this year? Who's got Yeah, it doesn't hands going up. Why is that important? Because Randy Shaver, some of you recognize the name from the University of Wisconsin, said for every 10 points improvement, that's two pounds more milk. Or a pound less corn, you've got to buy. This number here, 50, 60, and 70. So if you are 50 now, and next fall you get that kernel processor on your farm, or if you're doing custom chopping, he gets her up to 70, you are just going to get four pounds of milk from the door. You're stealing it from the door. If you do this and you're counting, you got to go to the fish. Because now that's one of the, one of the, uh, Man, I shall not steal. But we'll move on. We'll move on. Not many people laughing have to make happens in the back. We move on. We say everybody's doing it right. Here's some brand new data from Carolyn Lab. And you'll see here's 70. About half the people got it right. These guys are really losing money over here. That used to be a lot more. But only about half the people are getting it at the optimum. And the new optimum is what? 70. Not 70. 75. So if you're really going to hammer uh, this corn size kernel to get it done. And here's the last one that's called fecal starch. How many people are running those? And that's right. You're going to scoop up manure from 10 or 12 different cows in high strength. And you're going to run a starch analysis through the forage testing lab. Cost you about 25 bucks. So now I'm going to test the manure. That's based on some fun work of, of Penn State uh, Veterinary College. Those of you in the front row can see this. Can you see the little white specks there? Guess what you think that is? Starch. Starch. Now, we grew up in a farm, I farm in Greenville, Wisconsin. Every morning I'd spread manure. Guess what come out of the woods? Pheasants. Yeah, how much? They knew there was corn and it was still warm. They were off it. I want to take a shotgun. Mom would not throw on that. You're not putting a shotgun on a car, on a tractor, but we move on. <laughs> so this is the new data. This is the data. This is some, oh, a lot of data from the same lab. Six thousand samples, and if that starch is over five, <laughs> over five percent, people start from here. People start. Now, New Hampshire, they say, "Well, Mike, you can't do that because you're in Marford. You don't measure twenty four hours. Uh, we're on the farm." Sorry. So this is kind of a crude measure, but be very effective. If it's over five percent starch, you got to cheat. Now, is it the corn silage? 
Are you going to change that now here in March? Next foliage. Next foliage. If it's coming from barley or corn, you're going to grind it fine. You're going to make sure that we're going to steal our milk out of that heat as well. And the last one is milk to rid of nitrogen. Everybody here is getting, I'm sure, every milk processor in the United States now gives you milk to rid of nitrogen. Powerful tool. And the magic number I'm looking for is 8 to 12. And my good farms are together. So it simply means I'm capturing that nitrogen and not putting it up in the urine. We call that the urine business. I'm going to make it more available to the microbes. We're just going to ask it up there in the water. So we're done. On time for just a few questions, if we have them, we welcome them as well. Lots of tools out there. I hope you found one that you're going to go and prove me wrong. If you that fat guy is going on, he keep a crack on his neck. Number two. Control components. I can call control accurately for fuel, for fertilizer, for seed costs, or labor costs. I do control my forwarding for costs there. Milk yield, milk components always make me money. And one of my good co workers two years ago said, You, Darren, and me, maybe not be able to save your, uh, save your way by cutting things out to make a profit in 2023. And with that, we will stop and certainly welcome any questions you may have. From your cows and you listen to what they have to say to you and you make things better on your farm. We're doing that for you as consumers and Madeline's gonna to talk to you about that today. She has lots of accolades that you can read in your um, program so that we don't take up more time, but she's here to, she'll prove it all to you right now. All right. Do you want to stand at the podium or would you like to pour it back? Uh, yeah, that's fine. All right. And if you'd like, or up to you, yep. you can use this too. I am um, screen sharing because I'm recording so that folks that didn't intend uh, get a chance to see this meeting. And that's all I need to share with you. You're awesome. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so great to be in this part of the country. It's, it's a beautiful area. Don't get to visit here that often. So happy to be here. Also for me, this was a learning session this morning. So uh, happy to learn more about what's going on on the farm. You know, we've heard talk about some of the feed additives and, and what that might have in terms of impact on sustainability. So, you know, very interested there. And certainly it's something we wanna explore with consumers in the future as well. Um, but what... All right, sorry. Can everybody go in back? Okay, good. All right. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is really take you through some of the big trends that are occurring from a consumer perspective. So we'll look at some external forces that are happening in the market. We'll also look at, you know, some of what we call mega trends. So, for example, um, you know, many things are affecting how consumers are buying today. Certainly, we know that we're in a very, very challenging environment with regards to kind of economic uncertainty. So we'll take a little bit of a peek at that. And then importantly, we'll look to see what kind of impact that has with regards to our own product categories. Um, we're also gonna be taking a look at something that has been happening over a longer period of time. Uh, so whereas hopefully inflation is maybe short-term an event, at least we're crossing our fingers, um, we are looking at demographic change that's been occurring for, for decades and decades. But it really has an impact in terms of how consumers are buying the category and also what segments of categories are important to them. You know, how are they making those decisions and how are those changing over time? So we'll take a peek at that as well. Um, and then, as I said, there's some mega trends that are in place today. Uh, one of them is proactive health. So certainly I think as you know, COVID hit back in 2020, it was something that just created a lot of attention for consumers as to their own health. You know, they started to see that they were a little bit more vulnerable perhaps than they thought. They saw many of their friends and others get sick and die, et cetera. So people started turning inward and we're gonna take a little bit um, of a look at what's happening with regards to that. And again, what kind of impact does that have on this category? And then on a related term, we're gonna also look at responsible, what we call responsible consumption. So consumers who are shopping and making decisions with regards to not only their own health, but they're also looking at the health of the planet as well. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna to try to tie some of the trends that are happening with regards to health as well as taste uh, to our specific categories. 
And so as you can see here, we'll talk about digestive health. We'll also look at protein, whole fat, we'll look at sugar, and then importantly also, we'll look at how consumers are buying from an indulgence perspective. Um, please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Um, certainly, I know I don't want to take too much of your time as well. We have other things on the agenda, but you know, happy to address either today or else um, if something comes up after the fact as well. So first of all, uh, one thing we want to know is what's really on consumers' minds today. You know, what's worrying the nation? What's worrying? Uh, what's worrying the entire world? Actually, at this point in time, and as you can see here, inflation is one of the top issues consumers are wrestling with. And not only is it 52% of consumers who would place that in kind of the top tier, so to speak, of what they worry about, it's gone up 18 points since just a year or so ago. Um, and that's a true change, because if we went back to February of 2022, what we would find is that COVID was the top thing that people worried about. Now COVID's down to 12%. People are like, nah, that's the past, you know, I've moved on. Um, but this has such an implication in terms of how consumers are not only shopping this category, but also whether or not they're going out to eat. And so perhaps, you know, they're not having as many uh, meals outside of the home. It also has an impact in terms of what they have to pay for all their electric bills, feed costs, et cetera. So huge, huge implications for that. And then as you can see, all of the other things that we're looking at here today, not too much change that's been occurring. So crime and violence, you know, something that worries the world, probably a little bit more so than it does the United States. Climate change is something that's been pretty consistent with about one in five consumers in the U.S. Uh, worrying about that and wondering whether or not there's a part that they can take in it or what their expectations might be for businesses, for farms, et cetera. Um, so these are what's on consumers' minds at this point in time. And again, the data is from February of last month. So economic uncertainty. Uh, we talked a little bit about inflation uh, earlier today and just wanted to bring to your attention some of the numbers that we see here today. So again, this is data from February. Uh, it was just literally released, I think, on Monday or Tuesday of this week. Uh, so fresh data. And uh, we're able to look at what are prices today versus where they were a year ago. And so, for example, food away from home, prices have gone up percent versus where they were. And that's building on increases from last year as well. So a much, much higher percentage than we see. Uh, food at home, so that includes dairy products as well as you know all the other beverages and meats, et cetera, that people are buying, up about 10%. And then you can see dairy a little bit higher, up about 12% versus where it was a year ago. And even though dairy prices are even higher, perhaps, than where food is overall, Important thing to note is that dairy took its price increases a little bit later, so it's kind of lagging. So whereas we see that uh, food at home in general maybe is coming down a little bit more, I think we're going to start to see that in the next couple of months for, for the dairy products as well. I've also indicated what was the peak month. In other words, when did we finally start to kind of turn and see that change? And again, you can note that a difference from August of 2022 was the peak point of price increases for food overall. And for dairy, it was not until November. Um, and then also, as we look at individual products uh, with regards to dairy, one thing that you'll note, and certainly there's been a lot of attention with regards to the news on this, is butter is uh, the highest here. Uh, up Prices up about 20% versus where they were a year ago. However, if you look at where we were back in uh, December, they were up 31%. And again, that's the Christmas season, right? Uh, so very important point uh, that we're looking at. Uh, eggs, certainly another thing that's um, in the news a lot. Don't have it here, but something, again, that's a kind of a complement to many of the dairy products out there. So as, you know, egg prices go up, certainly you're going to find that people maybe are starting to shy away, don't have as many of them. Some of that carries, you know, milk or cheese along with it as well. But related note. Um, so not only what are the actual numbers in terms of those price increases, how are consumers feeling about that? You know, certainly we know that uh, the mood is not positive, right? People are feeling that the U.S. is on the wrong track. Uh, much of that is because of what they're seeing, not only in terms of their own wallets, but also, you know, how they're kind of looking at uh, what that longer term lens might be. You know, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? Are we going into one? Consumers still very uncertain. And certainly with the bank closures that just happened over the last week, again, something more to worry about. And so what we're looking at here is what we call a consumer sentiment index. It's, this comes out of the University of Michigan. 
you know, there's other places that also kind of capture similar type of information. But it takes into account how do you feel about business conditions? How do you feel about your own personal finances? And then what are your expectations? Do you think that things are kind of going better or are they going down the wrong track? And the 100 point would be kind of like the average, the baseline that goes all the way back to 1966. But what we've noted is that probably years prior to COVID, it was all hovering right about average. And then all of a sudden we start to see a little bit of drops that are taking place. And certainly our latest month that we have here, which is the end of February, we're at about a 67. So we're below what we would like people to see in terms of how they feel about the industry overall. Um, and when I say industry, I mean overall kind of world expectations for um, inflation as well as their own personal situation. If we go back to the last recession, the Great Recession, right, in 2007 to 9, we saw these numbers hit a low of about 55 to 60 or so. So we're, you know, a little bit better than maybe where we were how many years ago, but certainly, again, off on the wrong track from a consumer perspective. And the little bit of change that you see here is, is very subtle. And I think that just reflects the uh, fact that people are starting to see maybe prices a little bit uh, better in some cases than they were a couple months ago. Another, though, big trend that's operating out there and has been long, long term is what is happening in the U.S. overall. A lot of changes are occurring. And in fact, that seems to be a theme of this meeting. So much change occurring within the industry as well as the uh, more uh, external environment. And some of the things that I'm pointing out here is slowing growth. And we'll take a peek at what that actually means. But it's actually the smallest growth that we've seen since the Great Depression. And when we look at that, it, this has nothing to do even yet with COVID. These numbers are right before COVID kind of hit. So we were slowing for a long, long period of time. And we'll take a look at that. We also know that seven out of 10 households don't have any kids in them. And why is that important? Well, kids are the big consumers of dairy products. You know, as kids are kind of toddler age, that's the very highest consumption you ever see <laughs> with regards to dairy. And then it starts to kind of, you know, go down a little bit. Consumers start to move away from milk. They move more so towards cheese, but they never make up that difference. So fewer kids mean less consumption of dairy overall. We also know that um, the U.S. overall has more people of color than ever has in, um, in prior years. And certainly we also know that if you look across the United States, out of the 50 states, there are 39 states where people of color are over 20% of that population. Certainly that's not necessarily true of this area, but it still has cultural implications in terms of what kind of uh, cuisine are people eating, what types of foods. There are so many global influences that operate all across the country, whether or not these individuals live in your area or not. We also know that the average household is getting smaller and smaller. Right now, there's only 2.5 people on average in a household which means that fewer kids that are operating in the world today. And that is so different than where we were back in the 1970s when it was over three people in that household. Seems like a small difference, but really when you multiply it out by over 125 million households, it has major implications for what's going on with sales. And then lastly, just think about income impact. We really see kind of a wealth gap that's operating in the US. You know, the wealthiest have gotten even more wealthy. Those who are on the bottom, the lower income, are hurting a whole lot. Um, certainly, you know, when they got those extra stimulus checks last year, things were really good. Now that that's been pulled away, people are very, very strapped for cash. And again, how do they stretch that wallet to try to buy the food that they need? And finally, the middle class, you know, people don't necessarily talk about that. They talk about kind of the extremes, but they've been hit as well. Um, from a couple of different perspectives. One is that they're more likely to have investments. So they've seen a lot in terms of that market loss. Um, but then also they are seeing that uh, a lot of debt has been taken over. So, you know, as we think about the beginning of this year, we start to see a change in terms of sales. In other words, sales are at the start of the year, not on a very positive note. And we'll take a look at that a little bit. But the reason why is because people racked up so much debt over the holiday period of time. They need to pay that off. And again, how do I start to you know, think of strategies to help me um, save a little bit of money?
Um, so all of this is the environment in which we, along with all the other food companies in the world, are dealing with. So I mentioned a little bit about slowing growth. And this is a chart that I thought was pretty interesting. It looks at decade by decade what's been happening in the U.S. And this is the average kind of growth that's taken place during that time period. And as you can see here in kind of red, from 2010 to 2020, the U.S. population grew at 7.4%. That's much, much different than it was just a couple decades, uh, a couple decades ago when it was almost double that rate. And certainly you can also see that it's very similar to where we were back in the Great Depression years. So as we think about kind of that slowing growth, what it means to us is that, you know, typically, you know, the more people that come into an area, the more likely you're going to have greater sales of a product, correct? Um, so as that slows, you don't have that natural organic growth of population, growth of sales that's occurring. So that means we have to try to increase the amount of dairy an individual person has so that we can keep those sales high. And on the right-hand side here, you can see these changes that have been occurring over time. You know, certainly during kind of that first year of COVID, which would be 2021 here, because this data goes through like kind of the middle of the year, it only rose 0.1%. Uh, and in the most recent year, 2022, it raised 0.4%. Very, very slow. And the projection is that it'll be very slow as we move forward as well. Um, I happened to also look at the state of Maine to see what was happening with regard to your own population, which is a little bit higher than what we're seeing here, which is great. Um, Illinois, from where I come, uh, is one of the top, I guess, states, I would say, that's losing population, almost 1% uh, down, as well as New York. Um, so certainly, you know, there's a lot of migration that's occurring within the U.S. that is helping to kind of bolster sales in certain areas and maybe cause a lot of hardship in other areas. Florida, for one, Texas would be, you know, very, very large kind of gainers at this point in time. And here, this is a chart that helps us to understand what's happening with the overall population from an age perspective. So as we look at, I think it's the Navy line at the very top, this would be what's the percentage of the population that is, is child. Um, so anyone, you know, under the age of 18, basically. And you can see um, where it went up was when the baby boomers were born, right? And now it continues to decline, decline. And at this point in time, it's only about 20% of the population. And on the other side of it, as you look at those age 65 and over, again, it's growing, growing. And now again, you see kind of that boomer effect that's operating in terms of pushing it along with people living longer, et cetera. And if you look at those differences in terms of average annual growth, basically kids are, are almost flat, whereas the age 65 population is growing about two and a half percent. So again, what kind of implications? You know, how does that impact the types of products maybe people want in the store? How does that impact whether or not people go out to eat? Because what we know is that younger individuals are those who are more likely to be at restaurants versus um, the older population. So again, some major implications. Here we're looking at the difference in terms of the changing diversity within the US. On the left-hand side are numbers from 2020. On the right-hand side, what the projections right now are for 2035. And that gray color on the bottom are basically the white non-Hispanic population, which is declining in many parts of the world or world and the US as well. And what we can see here is that it really is being um, driven by those younger generations. So again, thinking about white non-Hispanic population, the average age is a little over. Whereas for you know Asian population, Hispanic population, the black population, they're in their 30s. So it's a much different kind of dynamic that we're seeing here. Um, and that's why we had seen some aging uh, numbers a little bit earlier. But as we think about kind of that white non-Hispanic population, it's going to be less than 50% for anyone under the age of 40 as we hit that 2035 mark. Again, you know, what's the implication? So a lot of trends that are operating, but what does it mean for us? Well, it makes a difference because people of color are less likely to kind of embrace or engage with dairy products. Um, they're still buying them, but they buy them at reduced rates. 
And the numbers that we've seen this very uh, first column is that they're spending less on dairy. So as we see the white non-Hispanic is spending about $700 a year on dairy products. And when I say dairy, I mean, it's through the grocery store, for example, they're buying milk, cheese, butter, ice cream, et cetera. Whereas a Hispanic might be buying $600 worth it. And then the Asian drops to the 500 mark. And then we also see the black population drop to 400. And we see a, a very similar pattern in terms of consumption, um, much lower consumption. We also see that they're a little bit less likely to say, you know what, I raise my hand and say, I love the product. Um, and then we also know they're more likely to suffer from lactose intolerance. And that is oftentimes a reason that they give for not consuming any dairy products. And finally, think about all the different health conditions that exist out there today. Many of those are more so for people of color. Uh, for example, diabetes, heart issues, et cetera, weight problems um, tend to be associated a little bit more with some of the, these um, particular populations. And as we can see here, the white uh, population and Asian are uh, reporting fewer health conditions than some of these other groups. Another trend that's operating, and this has really been operating over a long period of time, but I would say that COVID really just raised uh, the elevated this particular issue. And it's that people are just trying to be a little bit more proactive about their overall health. Um, so we find that half of consumers are saying that wellness is a very high top priority for them um, as they approach day to day. That's grown just in the last couple of years um, by about eight points. So much, much big difference that's operating. They're taking it more into their own hands. Um, a lot of people are kind of like Dr. Google, right? They're always going on to try to find new information or try to, you know, uh, self understand uh, what their issues might be from a health perspective. We also see that eating is a big part of health and that more people are saying that they actually have a plan in place to try to address their overall health through food and beverages. So again, think about food as food as medicine. So it's not just something for enjoyment or fueling, et cetera. It could actually help you perhaps to alleviate some of the concerns you might have from a health perspective. Again, we see a large increase operating here. And the reason why, it's more so about looking at your longer term health. Again, COVID caused people to think more futuristic, more about prevention uh, than they have in the past. So when they think about overall health and wellness, consumers are taking a more holistic approach towards it. And by that, what I mean, it's not just your physical health, it's also your mental health. Uh, we're finding more and more people are reporting depression than ever before. We're finding four in 10 adults are saying that they are suffering from kind of some stress or anxiety. Um, so all of this is elevated and people are in, again, uh, a not a good state, right? Mentally, um, and certainly it's affecting their physical abilities as well. We also know that people recognize how important sleep might be to them. We also understand the whole drinking water. In fact, uh, people say that their top resolution for the year was to drink more water, six, seven out of 10 people. Um, so they understand like hydration is important to my overall physical health. Um, certainly milk cup, you may have seen, gonna need milk for that uh, hydration um, ad that's trying to put milk into that perspective because research is suggesting that milk um, could play that role. And it's also connecting with other people. And on the right hand side here, you can see high numbers kind of across many of these different areas, which again says that every individual is taking many, many things into account as they think about their overall health. On here, you know, a lot of numbers, we're not necessarily gonna go through the numbers, but I just wanted to share with you from a consumer lens, what are those top health and wellness priorities that they have? And we looked at this across many, many different uh, data sources to try to understand, first of all, what's the size of that market? And this was back in 2021. And then you can see underneath it, what is the average kind of growth over a five year period of time? So all of these are kind of the top areas out of, I think we looked at maybe 40, 45, uh, where people we really see some uh, momentum kind of building behind them. So number one is energy. And it's not just energy, meaning quick energy. Um, it's also kind of that longer term sustained energy. So consumers just trying to say, hey, you know what, sometimes I just need a pick me up, you know, I hit three o'clock, you know, and I shut down, 
So that's a, a number one um, priority for everyone. Physical performance, again, not just necessarily for people who are super athletes, but also for the person who maybe is more of kind of that weekend warrior. Um, so looking to kind of improve maybe where their own objectives might be. Skin health, um, more so important from even a younger consumer perspective. The mental, emotional, health and well-being. Many of the things that we saw in previous charts are important to consumers, you know, as we move forward into this next year. And then I refer to responsible consumption. And what consumers are trying to do is recognize the fact that they can vote with their dollar. So they want something that is not just perhaps for me, but I'm gonna try to also look at kind of the world around me because I know that those choices that I make, you know, have the ability to make a difference in the world. And you can see here from these numbers that people feel that the products that they're buying, the beverages that they're drinking, they're almost kind of a badge of honor. Uh, that you feel proud that uh, it's part of your own identity and that people notice, you know, what's important to you, that you're aligning with what your own personal values might be. And certainly sustainability is a big piece of that. But one important thing to note is that because we're in such a difficult situation with regards to inflation, many people are saying, you know, I recognize sometimes the sustainable version, perhaps of a laundry detergent, is just much more expensive than the regular one. So even though I want to buy that, right now I can't afford to buy that. So we note that that's about half the population who is saying, you know, I'm struggling with what my what I think versus what I can actually act upon today. But we do know that sustainability is gaining importance with consumers. And here we just have a few statistics that help to kind of reinforce that. So people saying three quarters of the population saying, you know, I feel that sustainability is important when I buy products and it's up from just 69% versus just a year ago. So again, big jumps in small amount of time, but think about what people have seen on the news, all the images that they've been seeing with regards to, you know, what's, uh, what's happening with regards to the beaches, the oceans, you know, what's happening with regards to the air, et cetera. So people recognizing that there is a problem that's out there and also kind of all the crazy weather patterns that have been operating in recent years have uh, reinforced that as well. And then we also see that as new products are being launched, about half of them are carrying some kind of claim of sustainability. So again, they're getting more press within the store itself. People are recognizing that as well. And what we do know is that products that are more or less sustainably claimed, I would say on the package, um, are seeing much higher rates of sales growth within the stores than kind of their counterparts are. Um, again, you know, some of these credentials, maybe one could question um, whether or not they are correct, but we do know that anything labeled like that from a consumer perspective is doing well. And where, you know, where does environmental sustainability fit with regards to all of the other factors kind of that influence how people purchase products? You know, probably to no surprise, taste is always going to be number one. That's the reason why you buy cheese or you buy uh, ice cream, et cetera. Price becomes another very important element to it, the health of the product, how convenient it is. But then we also see environmental sustainability. So not the key driver, but certainly a secondary driver. And the key point here is that it's really, again, increased versus where we've been before. Um, and just to note that this tends to be something that is more um, highly uh, indexed among those younger generations, so millennials in particular. Um, and that makes it even more important because that's kind of the future, right? So they're going to take those beliefs, those values, and move forward with them. Um, so that's your, your future consumers for quite a while. And I wanted to share one chart here, which is looking at consumer opinion with regards to the dairy industry and dairy farms. And um, this tracker that we have here is anyone from age 13 on up. It's a nationally representative sample. Um, so it's taking into account all the various age groups and uh, income groups, et cetera. And consumers were kind of given an opinion scale. So do you believe that dairy farms are good for the environment or do you believe that they're harmful to the environment? Do you think that you know, cows are major contributors to greenhouse gas emission or not? So again, it's just to kind of monitor where are consumers' heads at with regards to these issues. And as you can see here, 
the strong positives are much higher than the negatives, which, which is great. That's where we would like it to be. But the important part is that there's a lot of people in the middle. Obviously, they don't really know what's going on on a dairy farm, right? This is kind of their gut reaction. It's also a result of factors maybe that they've read in the news. We also know documentaries are, are very, very much um, swaying a lot of opinion, particularly for younger consumers, um, oftentimes in a negative manner. Um, but it also could be, you know, images that people have seen with regards to the industry as well. So again, you know, the important point is that the left, the positives are higher, um, but it's also telling us that the middle are those people that we can actually shape a little bit more, right? We can influence these people because they have no solid views at this point in time. So I think it allows us a good opportunity um, for the future. Section, we'll just look at some of the trends that are operating out there. Digestive wellness is, is very, very important today. People are recognizing that gut health is more than just you know, the gut itself. It really affects everything about you. Everything's kind of interconnected and consumers are understanding and hearing that. Many of them are saying that they suffer from duress with regards to di digestion issues. And many believe that it's the most important thing with regards to their overall health. Um, so it's a very, very large market and in the dairy uh, industry, you know, we're really trying to target this market, right? So I'm sharing a few numbers that we have here. One would be lactose-free milk. This directly goes along with digestive health. It also connects very closely with to people of color. And we've seen average annual growth at 10% per year. So amazingly high. Um, and certainly many of the products that are in there um, there's a lot of private label products in there. Lactate would be a big one. Fairlife milk would be a big one and many, many others. Um, A2 milk, fairly small still. It's less than 1% share of the milk category, but it's something again that is promising consumers, you know, that it's easier on the stomach and consumers are right now exploring that product um, from a trial perspective, 15% annual growth. Um, and then if we think about yogurt, Probiotics right now are probably the most closely associated with gut health today. And again, seeing about a 7% growth rate. So all of these individual segments are kind of surpassing the category itself. So many opportunities for additional build. Whole fat is another area. Um, certainly we all know the old kind of Time magazine. Um, you know, one time, you know, butter and eggs were kind of the bad guys. And now, you know, eat butter. Uh, who would ever think that would be on the front page of a, such a ma major magazine? Um, but we've also seen, you know, good things that are happening in dairy because of things of this nature. And in fact, we also can see that keto diets are kind of supporting this whole fat trend as well, with many consumers, you know, vying for those. And again, looking at how this impacts our category, you know, total milk sales are down at retail. Whole fat, though, is kind of surpassing that. Um, we see from a yogurt perspective, whole fat, again, kind of showing larger growth than the category at large. In cheese, whereas most cheese is whole fat cheese, right? It's 94% category share, but you can see the whole fat piece is even a little bit higher than that. So again, fat is trending. Fat is now. Consumers are, are enjoying that. It brings better taste profiles to them, and they feel good now about buying those products. And the last one here would be just simple pleasures. So, you know, we talked a lot about health and how important that is to the consumers, but we also know consumers want to be rewarded, right? They need to take kind of a break from eating everything that they should and start to eat something that maybe is just for themselves, for comfort, a familiarity, for enjoyment. And these are just some examples of products that we see in the marketplace. Um, you know, yogurt that is, you know, it's a healthy kind of indulgence, so to speak, because um, it's covered in chocolate, but it has Greek yogurt in there. Um, and then we also see on social media, um, the baked feta pasta was such a big, big hit that uh, certainly a lot of stores were out of stock on feta cheese. And we saw unbelievable growth in that category. I had not known that that trend was in place, but when I started looking at the data, I kept thinking there's gotta be something wrong. I've never seen it this high. Uh, it's amazing and wonderful. Oh, and one, one last one I guess we have here is high protein and low sugar, my apologies. Uh, but protein, you know, very important to consumers, the number one nutrient people want, even though right now, according to, you know, government figures, 
we're getting enough protein in our diet, but people are looking for it for many, many reasons, you know, to, to try to better manage their weight. Uh, they're also looking at it to try to, you know, preserve some muscle or build muscle, et cetera. So 40% of consumers wanting more protein. And kind of an accompaniment to that would be low sugar, particularly in the milk category. So sugar is viewed as kind of the demon. It's the number one thing you should not have in your diet. You know, it's terrible for weight gain and um, uh, health conditions, et cetera. And as we look to the right-hand side, we can see that the number of new products kind of coming on the bandwagon to try to reduce sugar just continues to grow. And right now it's about 11%. And again, kind of bringing back to dairy category, we see high protein, low sugar milk, 16% um, annual growth rate, unbelievable. Um, and the low sugar yogurts, again, surpassing the category. So it's important for us to always connect with what the consumer's looking for and certainly build on those uh, improvements. So just some of the implications, we talked about a few of these already, uh, but one important one, I guess I would say is value. And value isn't always kind of affordability. It is to many consumers, affordable nutrition, but it's also bringing value in terms of benefits. It could be a lactose-free benefit, a probiotic benefit, whatever it might be, but trying to, again, connect with that consumer. Um, other things, as we see the population change in terms of maybe smaller households, you know, maybe there's fewer people who need gallon-sized jugs. Maybe they're looking for smaller items. Um, maybe consumers are looking for products that are more for an adult base, not necessarily just kids and flavored milks, et cetera. So always trying to connect to that consumers. And finally, don't forget kind of the key basics, taste, convenience, and also the ability to indulge. And I just have one last slide I wanted to share with you. Um, I looked up kind of the, the Maine, the state of Maine, with how are retail sales doing? And what we're looking at on the left-hand side would be uh, the average growth from nine, 2019 to 2022 by category. So whipping cream, you know, it's, it's been part of this whole keto diet. It's been doing wonderfully. It's, it's amazing. Um, frozen novelties all during the pandemic, people looking for kind of a convenient treat to try to comfort themselves. Cheese is always a long-term trend. Um, as you can see here, nine out of 10 categories, um, uh, really unbelievable uh, strength in terms of overall retail sales. And then as we move into the very early part of 2023, this data is through March 5th, uh, we see a little different story operating, mainly that inflation kind of took hold, people are a little bit more cautious with their spending, and you can see fewer green um, categories, uh, but certainly still, you know, what, half, half of the dairy category is still growing. And the most important one, I guess I would say, is cheese, just because it's so huge uh, in terms of uh, overall usage of, of milk here. And then just as a comparative, you know, how does Maine compare to the U.S.? You know, as you look, you know, just quickly glancing towards it, you'll note that Maine kind of surpasses kind of the country at large in terms of overall growth in products. And certainly um, not only in 2019 to 2022, but certainly also in 2023. So uh, a lot of strength that's operating this area, uh, which is great to see. It was I actually focused on just the state. Usually I look at kind of regions of the country. Um, and I don't know if you're pulling in all the people from New York here or what, but uh, doing great. So with that, um, happy to take questions, happy to let you take a break and have lunch, um, but thank you so much.